Welcome to this episode of Substance. This week I'm honored to talk with award-winning author, entrepreneur, and columnist, Shell Israel. He is also the co-author with Robert Scoble of the upcoming book, The Age of Context. Please join us as we talk about storytelling, past, present, and future. Okay, well, Shell, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you taking the long drive down from Marin County to uh, be with me and talk to me about some great things here today. Thanks, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. It wasn't a pleasure to get here. <laughs> but I figure I've now nurtured you with guilt, and maybe you'll be easy on me in the questions. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Oh, so, okay, well, I'm sorry, I'm running behind schedule I have to go right now. Before you go, let me ask you a couple okay. quick questions. Okay, we have time for quick couple of questions. All right, good. Your main thing is around technology and where technology is heading. Um, you like to be at the forefront of technology as, I, as I've um, read and seen a lot of your work. What I'm also interested in is what got you to the point where you're now interested in technology. How did you start writing about technology? Where did that all begin? That's an old story. Um, it, 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 it's where I began was wanting to be a writer and it took me many, many years to get to that point where I actually could call myself that. Um, and very early on, I worked for a magazine called San Francisco Magazine. And I was covering this entrepreneur, a word I couldn't spell, from Silicon Valley. And this guy just got me going. He was talking about how computing was going to change the way we live, work, communicate. And I went up to Steve Jobs after that. And I said, you've inspired me. Wow. I'm an old hippie. I used to write speeches for the governor of Massachusetts, and now, now I work for the Schlock magazine, and I'd like to come with you, and I'd like to really uh, help you spread the word that you just spread to us tonight. And he looked at me from head to toe and said, so you write, huh? He says, yeah. He says, well, my flack is Regis McKenna. Contact him. Mm. And as I followed him out the door into a rainy, dark night, he disappeared. After having left a room inspired and standing mm. up and down, I realized then for the first time that Steve Jobs is much better in front of 100 people than he is in front of one. Mm. Wow. That's how I got started. Incredible. So where, where did that lead I for you? I went to Regis McKenna. Okay. And I applied for a job as a writer there, and I started as a writer at Regis McKenna, and very shortly afterwards, Regis took me aside and said that I seemed to be bright or I have potential. No, he never called me bright. He said I had potential, and that I would be more where the action is, and I would make more money if I became an account executive. And that meant I would have to call up the press and pitch them rather than be the press and get pitched. And uh, I had really a good deal of ambivalence until I found out how much more I would be making, and my ambivalence just went away. And then I began what was one of several careers for me that was a, as a PR guy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the PR part turned out to be exciting because Regis really did see the strategic, vital nature of it, and we were to we were at the beginning. It was uh, Genentech and Intel and Apple. Uh, my first startup came a little while later, a couple of years later. It was called uh, Sun Microsystems. Do you remember them? Mm -hmm. And I got to schlep around New York City with the founders, uh, a couple of the founders of Sun, and um, found that you really could go talk to a small group which was then the media and you could change the world and my role in all that was pretty exciting and so I was there at the beginning of it and being at Regis at that time was pretty exciting. How did that turn into your authorship? You've gone now from from PR to technology into presentations and, and now, now, now being a, a, a well-known author. Well, <laughs> somewhat well-known author, but uh, that's also a 30-year voyage. Um, yeah, let's back up to the beginning. Um, being raised, I, I was a first-generation American, and I was being raised so that I wouldn't go have to work in the factories. I would go to college, I'd make a lot of money, I'd be a lawyer, or if I could handle the blood, I could be a doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, but I just liked writing. 
you know, in high school, I got the first job I loved, which was writing about the church league basketball team for the New Bedford Standard Times. Um, I think I got $2 a game, and boy, I loved that. It was better than uh, lawn sprinkling money in the summer anyway. Mm -hmm. And I just loved it, but everybody who counseled me along the way said, don't go into writing, there's no money in it. Mm -hmm. And so my whole life is really sort of this ping pong game between being a writer, loving the work, and hating the vow of poverty, finding something that was more lucrative, such as PR, mm -hmm. um, such as a bunch of things I've done, and really liking having money to have a nice car and go on vacation and help kids get through college. Uh, on the other hand, at some point, I would always end up saying, this really sucks and I'm unhappy and I have to go back to the writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm still doing that. Um, between writing, I, um, I consult. Uh, this time around, of course, I expect the book will sell a couple of million. I'll never have to do that again. But consulting the right companies and focusing on how they can tell their story really isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, it pays a lot better than the places that I have been known to work mm -hmm. for. So the PR side of it is really interesting because you've seen probably more changes um, uh, than most. You've gone through the traditional side of PR, mm -hmm. and now you've seen social media. You've written a book with Robert Scoble on mm -hmm. naked conversations and blogging. Um, what kind of changes took place for you in PR, and where, where do you see it heading? You know, th there's an old, old, old phrase that predates me, which puts it about at the age of dirt. Um, I am not older than dirt, that's the point of that. Um, and that's a simple story well told. And at the core of a great deal is that. Way, way, way back, um, our ancestors lived in caves and some of them went out and they uh, used sticks and stones and teamwork and brought down this big mastodon and they dragged it back into the cave and they had already invented alcoholic beverage so they imbibed what we would call wine delicately these days and they ate the mastodon and maybe they had some fire so that they ate cooked mastodon and slowly they all gathered around as the night went on this fire and somebody said tell us how you killed the mastodon oh orc and orc would use grunts and gestures and maybe pick up a stick and dry it in the dirt and sooner or later it would be happy and they'd go to sleep except maybe one and that was one probably who wasn't big and strong and good at hunting and that one went took a little blood took a little berries took a stick and went to the wall and started drawing pictures. And we had the beginning of the tradition of storytelling. Somewhere along the line, PR was very good at telling stories. Mm -hmm. uh, then they got good at making up stories, which is another part of it. Mm -hmm. But at this point, what happened is PR people who began by understanding the public, who understood how to have relationships with the public, thus PR, started being client service people. They started trying to make clients happy. And the clients started saying, don't tell these stories anymore. We need buzz. Get us some buzz. And they forgot that buzz is the sound you hear just before you get stung. <laughs> that brings us about to 2000 in Silicon Valley. Uh, we had a dot-com craze going on. Everybody talks about the terrible uh, time. Well, we had some of the most enduring companies in the history of technology come out, companies like Google. Uh, Facebook was a little later, but uh, Amazon.com. If you look through it, some very enduring companies came out because they took something that PR was lagging behind. They took the Internet. They figured out they could start disrupting mm -hmm. all sorts of things, all channels of distribution, all middle people, and getting directly to customers. For PR people, this was a real problem because they were disintermediary people. They, they were supposed to stand behind, between clients and, comp and, and constituencies. Mm -hmm. And they could not do this if everything flattened down as the internet did. Yeah, um, And 
they had several advantages. One is that everyone has been and perhaps still is pretty bad at marketing online. Mm -hmm. um, if marketing is supposed to be about relationships with your constituencies, um, cramming things down their throats and putting it in front of their faces and making noises and having radio ads that go beep when you're driving down the road, this isn't a relationship. This mm -hmm. is... This is can't amount to being at a party. Now, PR people are good at parties because they're good networkers. And you're having a good talk with a friend. You and I are there. We're talking about the old days on the East Coast when I went to New Jersey and lost my college tuition in a jam joint. Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> and suddenly in the middle of this nice conversation, somebody walks up to us and he's wearing a plaid suit. And he says, hey, my name's Joe, and here's my card right here, buddy. Mm -hmm. And you and I look at each other, and we have a little tiny uh, nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. I hope I can say this. And one of us says the word asshole, mm -hmm. and the other one nods. And we say, excuse us, and we walk away, and we rejump. We have our own conversation. Okay. And PR became that. It became an intruder. It got in the way ah. of the story. It hyped. It tried to make noise. And on the journalist side of me, it, it came a point where PR people started moving from being valuable resources who could give me background, insight, prepare me for the right things to get before an interview to somebody who was just making noise and getting in my way and I was going to do whatever I could to get around them. Right. Thus, the internet became my way of getting away from the PR people. There was this new thing that was called email. Yeah. Until, of course, I've the marketer. Yeah, yeah. But then PR and marketing people got into email, and guess what happened? Our mailbox filled up. We had all this noise, and right there were the gems we wanted. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I have a point to it other than there are phases that keep going on and on and on. The internet is now mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, any company that isn't looking at their primary strategy uh, in terms of the internet and beyond it into the contextual stuff that we're writing about now, anybody who doesn't do that we should discuss in past tense. Because mm -hmm. if they're not dead, their customers are aging, their revenues are going down, they're more concerned about the cost of goods sold than they are about growing markets, they're boring and unnewsworthy and old and who cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now let's, talk, let's take that globally. I want to talk about a little bit about the global neighborhood. Uh, and how that's a non sequitur, but it's one of my favorite non sequiturs. Yeah, yeah, I want to shift a little bit because I want to make sure that we can talk <coughs> about how proximity has changed. I was having coffee with Charlene Lee. I love to drop names like that um, before either of us were that famous, but she was at Forrester at the time. And we were marveling at this new thing that we were both playing around with. It was called blogging. Um, and I was getting excited and thinking of writing a book about it, but I couldn't find anybody dumb enough to write a book with a PR guy. Thank you, Robert. Um, but Charlene said in the middle of the conversation, I, I said how I was really thrilled. I was talking in the course of a day to people in Egypt, Italy, Russia, China. This was amazing. And I was finding I had things in common. And she looked at me and said, the internet is making geography irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my few really bang me in the back of the head I, uh, moments because I realized how much bigger my world had gotten in the year, year and a half that I was diddling around with uh, blogging. There was mm -hmm. nothing else I was doing. And I decided that I would change the name of my blog, which at that time was called, it seems to me, to Global Neighborhoods. Uh, it seems to me was good because it's a word I use writing a lot. It seems to me that the person I just spoke to might have been a little short of the truth. Mm. And it's a nice folksy way of talking, and um, that's a little different than my style of talking sometimes, but I kind of liked it. But moving to global neighborhoods meant that I was looking at a world that was reconfigured by shared interests and not by what neighborhood you're in. It was like eliminating the Crips and the Bloods or saying, hey, we're all one community. We like gang fights. Mm -hmm. And 
that's what happened. So there was a woman I spoke to very early on. I forgot her name, but she was in Adelaide, uh, Australia. And she told me a story. I never wrote this story, but I should have. All her life, she's really fancied hummingbirds. And living in a place like Adelaide, uh, her husband, her kids, her friends all made fun of her for being this crazy lady who grew things to attract hummingbirds. And she took pictures of hummingbirds, and then she started a blog. And she took a picture of a hummingbird that had red on one side and green on the other. She posted it, and within two days, somebody in China wrote, says, I've seen that very same hummingbird. Isn't that amazing? Uh, what's the weather like in Adelaide? And they found out the weather was kind of similar in the two places, and the humidity was kind of the same. They grew different plants, but they shared pictures of the plants, and they realized these are similar plants. And then somebody in Thailand joined in, mm. and so she started, never got to much, maybe a couple of hundred people. But there are people all over the world who are sharing her passions for hummingbirds. And that started getting me going on this theme that eventually... I would end up being the follower to Robert Scoble's lead mm. because while I was looking at the technology and its impact on humans, here's Robert who is probably the, the ultimate lover of shiny objects mm. with a passion for it and an ability that I still don't quite understand how he does it, to look at something in a few seconds know whether it's lame or it's going to go everywhere. Yeah. And he's often wrong, as some of his detractors likes to point out, but he is almost always right. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy that takes risks that I wouldn't dream. Of. For example, taking showers with Google Glass on. I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But he sees this stuff, and he feels this stuff, and he has a passion for it. Mm -hmm. And he talks to people with an enthusiasm that no other... Um, journalist, uh, Robert says he's a hybrid journalist, or so I recently read somewhere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but no one else does what Robert does because he's very honest and he won't say nice things about you to be a nice guy, but he just loves to tell you when he loves your stuff. Mm -hmm. And when he interviews you for his program, there's no better endorsement because he lets you get to say your say, he lets you go on for an hour, which mm -hmm. you won't do to me. Um, and he's remarkable. So you took me over here and saying, what's this technology mean to humankind? And there was Robert, who at the time was a Microsoft employee, mm -hmm. and he was just way ahead of the whole world. And then we said, okay, we'll write a book. I think Robert's, I went up to Seattle to pitch him. It was the second time we had met. And I think the words that confirmed we had a deal, I think I can quote him exactly. He said, cool. And we had a deal. And that's how Robert and I still do business together. But he did it over sushi. Uh, I said, come on, I'll buy you sushi. I had no idea the guy could eat over $100 worth of sushi in one sitting. <laughs> uh, I wasn't doing so well financially. If he asked for one more course, I was going <laughs> to plead mercy. But that was the beginning of it. And I did the writing and Robert did the saying, I think is the best way of looking at it. Then he would review what I said. And once a week, our process, he's much more involved now, but the process still has that rhythm. It begins with Robert telling me what he sees. Mm. And then I go and look for details. I go to Google. I search all these things. I interview people he's already talked about, and I fill in blanks like who, when, where, why, and what. Mm -hmm. No, he's got the what. I worry about the other details. Uh, is the company an LTD or an Inc.? I have to worry about things mm -hmm. like this. Somebody does. Um, but... From the beginning, we were an odd couple that understood that we really need each other because either of us would do something shorter than what we do when we're together. Mm -hmm. um, he just sees this stuff and he has access. Back with um, Naked Conversations, he'd say, yeah, uh, call up Bob, Bob Lutz. And I go, you mean the VP of General Motors? He said, yeah, here's his email. Just go in that way. And I said, okay. Um, Mark Cuban, um, okay. And every time I put the subject line, uh, Scoble sent me, uh, within 24 hours, I think uh, the Mavericks are in a playoff, so Cuban took a little longer. They lost, so then he could talk. Um, they would all take my calls. 
Wow. And they would talk to me. Some of them would be in email, and I wasn't absolutely sure that Lutz actually answered his own questions. I still have my doubts. But for Robert Scoble, who was six tiers down from Steve Ballmer at Microsoft, mm -hmm. um, to have access to these people in government, in, in corporate America, to have access in, in, in Europe, in China, to me, it was just amazing because I spent years pounding the beat and having what we used to call a Rolodex. Mm -hmm. And he just knew all these people from blogging, and they all trusted that if I was with him, I was okay. Mm. And they really opened up. They mm -hmm. said many, many things that I thought made the book special. Um, very, very few people actually gave a marketing pitch. They just told me stories, mm -hmm. which ties us all the way back to the kid in the cave. Because storytelling to me is at the essence of everything. Mm. Wow. I um, want to ask you about that co-creation, because you guys co-create together. How do you see co-creation in, in with social media moving forward? Now people are putting content together and building things. Some people have never met, a, they, and they're creating books together, and they're creating content of all kinds, video, writing. How do you see co-creation as the next evolution of what you just described? I'm not sure it is. Um, one of the things that I would say about Scoble and me before I go to co-creation is that one of the reasons we work so well, at least in writing books, is that we have different talent sets. And people try very often in co-creation to find people who are just like them. Mm. And then you end up, at least my perception of it, there are co-creators out there who probably would strongly disagree, but too often then you start competing with each other because you do the same stuff. Mm -hmm. I would never compete with Robert Scoble on looking at a new product and deciding its future. I would never compete with Robert Scoble on understanding trends that are going to change humanity. And I can't speak for Robert on the way back, but he seems to be pretty happy with me finding the words to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to do what he did, then we would try to outsmart each other, outcompete mm -hmm. each other, and that can be counterproductive. I also think co-creation can be a little bit, I live in Marin, the, 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 the global, the world center of touchy-feely, and I think co-creation has some dangers to it mm -hmm. because something like a book, something like a project that involves many people really needs structure. Um, I, I'm reminded of uh, David Miller, who was the agent for Cloutrain Manifesto where you had four brilliant people who were present at the creation of something and they could agree with absolutely nothing. So after a few months of frustration, he hauled them into, I think it was, it was somewhere in Colorado, a room. Uh, he didn't lock the door, but he, made, he discouraged leaving for any reasons other than hygienic, bi uh, biological need. And he forced them to outline uh, the chapters and then he gave each one the chapters they belonged, and they all went off and wrote their own stuff, and then he integrated it. He figured out the transitions, and you had a project that really was, to me, the, br uh, the beginnings of co-creation, and ironically, it may have uh, ushered in the uh, conversational age, but it really predated it. Um, they didn't have a blog to post on when they did that. I, I'm... Um extremely interested in context right now. I, I know it's one of the one of the biggest uh, challenges is to understand context around so much information. Tell me about that. How, how are you how do we get more context I in a sea a of same? I could write a book on that. <laughs> Rob and I after Naked Conversations we've had a couple of other products and projects and we've remained friends but we for the most part went separate ways. And every now and then we get together and uh, in February of last year, I dropped down to the uh, the sanctuary in Half Moon Bay, and we went for a walk in the rain, and we went back. And I joked about having been the first person to put social media strategist on a business card, hmm. and how today that was as valuable as having the words fax repairman on a business card, and how amazingly fast the world had changed 
and this ties back to what you asked before, um, that social media is just now another quill in a marketing arsenal, and it's used for supporting all this other cool stuff, but it's become an everyday thing. Um, you don't need a book now to explain that social media is valuable to a business anymore. They understand it from a strategic level, an economic level, blah, 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 blah. But Robert started talking about these five forces mm -hmm. that are coming together. Mobile, um, social media, sensors, data, and location-based technology. I'm always afraid I'll forget one because I'm not Robert. And how as they converge together, there's really a superstorm forming. And it's happening differently than one company coming along and disrupting the world. It's coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. There are tens of thousands of people involved in this technology. And what's the result of this technology is a lot of stuff. But at the essence is two things happen. One is our relationship with our technology gets uncannily close. Remember John Maklovich and the ad for Siri? Of course, the mm -hmm. ad was so much better than the product turned out to be. Mm -hmm. But he spends a quiet night alone in front of the fireplace chatting with a piece of bloody software. Mm -hmm. And people who see this ad don't find it odd. And, you know, I just saw an old movie called Reds last night with, with Maklovich in it. And... There he was, the guy who was firing up in the air when a plane came over because he was afraid of this stuff. But now, this is software at this time uh, that is going to know you better than your own spouse knows you. It's going to remember uh, all this sort of stuff. It's going to look out for you so that it, it knows that it's supposed to wake you at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., but it snowed last night, and it's already scoured the weather reports and scoured Waze or Google Waze, whatever it'll be soon, and has stitched together that, one, you need to be woken up early, two, is traffic is particularly bad, three, your office is still open and there is a way of getting in. So it decides to wake you up early, and you go to work. This is human thinking. This is so close to human thinking. This is artificial that it's actually, intelligence being smarter than some people I dated when I was single. <laughs> so how do you feel about that? Um, we have a recurring theme throughout the book, which is the freaky line. Um, all of us have a freaky line, and everything coming will touch on freaky lines. Mm -hmm. It tears out. I'm... 20 years older than Scoble, and my generation is going to hate a lot of this stuff. Uh, they didn't even get into social media as much as I did, and a few of my... Seems like people my age who got into it are still my friends. Mm -hmm. um, but down the hall, you have these kids who are going to grow up with this being natural. It's like under, understanding why people would possibly use a keyboard when they could have an iPad uh, and talk to it mm -hmm. and gesture at it and, um, or why anybody would be freaked out because glasses that look like this or just contact lenses are actually my computer and it sees what I see and it remembers what I don't remember and it can give it to me when I need to. Mm -hmm. Uh, all this is coming. It's coming very, very fast, and this is what context means to me. Um, the key two points are that the relationship with our devices is going to be far different than it is today. It's going to be more intimate. And the second thing is that our devices are going to be able to predict what we do or need or want next based on the context of where we are mm -hmm. and what we're doing. Um, I didn't specifically answer your context question, though, did I? You did. You defined it for me, and I, I, um, you know, actually, under, uh, we're out of time, and I could sit here and talk to you for a few more hours. I but, could write a book, uh, <laughs> yeah. and I look forward to reading it, Thank and you. I look forward to talking with you a little bit more here in the future. But Thank you. for now, thanks for thanks for joining me here today. Well, thanks. It was Appreciate a pleasure. It. it was great.